Hi, uh, for everyone watching, welcome back. We're really back. We're really happy to be back in person. Uh, today we have Ted Chafin. Uh, he just a little rundown. Uh, for 20 years, you were the president of the Russian Hammerstein organization. Actually, more than 20, but I'll take more than 20. 20. I'll take 20. Okay, more than, uh, <laughs> well, even more too, impressive. Don't want to seem too old. <laughs> Um, and you are also author of this book, Everything Was Possible, The Birth of the Musical Follies. You were a part of the original production I in was. 1971, and this is a legendary production. Um, you were 19 years old? Yeah. Okay, so... So we dated me. So, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. That's okay. No, it's like, it is what it is. <laughs> so Follies is this hugely famous kind of cult musical. Um, of Stephen Sondheim's The Book by James Goldwyn, Goldman. Um, it's loved and revered by many. And uh, as Frank Rich writes uh, in the foreword to your book, uh, from the start, critics have been divided about Follies, uh, passionately pro or con, but rarely on the fence. So is it really a great musical or merely the greatest of all cult musicals? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? First of all, he writes well, does he not? He does write well. <laughs> I will confess right off the bat that um, you know I so fell in love with company. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know that musical theater could be contemporary because the, the score of company is neither pop music nor theater music. It's mm -hmm. some wonderful creation in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a, a linear story, and yet it was always fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the staging was I, brilliant. I just I thought, I want to be part of this world. Mm -hmm. I, somehow I want to be part of this world. Mm -hmm. So I knew that Follies was going into rehearsal, what happened to be my, the second half of my junior year in college. Okay. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I could talk my way into observing the creation of a new original Broadway musical. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> so I talked the college into letting me do it, and I talked Hal Prince to letting me do it. I'd met Hal Prince a couple of times. Oh, before. okay, okay. Um, partly through a student program at the O'Neill Center that I had been on the, the semester prior to mm -hmm. this. Um, I, I, frankly, I played both sides off the other, the other one a little bit um, because Hal was a little reluctant, but in the college, the, it was time in college where you could pretty much get away with anything with a smile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I did. So, so, so I showed up as the observer. I was only going to observe mm -hmm. this, this show and from the, from the get-go. Um, they were over budget, and they did not have a big staff, and they did not have a gopher. They did not have a production assistant. Okay. So within 10 minutes of my being at the rehearsal, I, I was asked to go get coffee. And at first I thought, mm, I've done that. I've done that several times before that. Yeah. Having grown up in New York, and figuring it's a way into the theater. But I did it, and then, I, then it didn't take me long to realize that that gave me kind of a position in the company. So I wasn't just a stranger sitting there watching. Mm -hmm. um, I was a part of the group mm -hmm. getting coffee, but also sitting there and watching. Yeah. Because that's what I was really interested yeah. in. Um, and every night, every I had my little three ring or the, you know spiral bond uh -huh. notebook in which I would write, you know, X Alice Sandwich, dollar seventy five. Uh -huh. um, that book is at Lincoln Center Library and it's quite frightening to see the prices. <laughs> um, but I would go home every night sit at a typewriter, remember those, some, some of you, um, and just type out my observations of what I saw that day. Um, usually about three pages uh -huh. every night, but I, I did that every day during rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So it allowed me to write a report for school, which they needed, um, but it, I just threw it in a box. And yeah. as the years went on, and Follies, and Sondheim's career grew, how Prince, their collaboration, mm -hmm. Sondheim and Prince went on, and Michael Bennett went on, and then did Chorus Line. It's like suddenly that box sitting in the corner of all this stuff mm -hmm. became more interesting mm -hmm. because people were interested in, in, uh, in the show. And um, anyway, it's a long-winded way of saying, do I think it's a great musical or the greatest of all cult musicals? I was so close to it that I love every minute of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that it is, it, it is a musical that operates on so many different levels mm -hmm. that it, it, it is an extraordinary piece of work. And it is an ex a piece of work so extraordinary that you can uh, approach it and it will give you things uh, at any level of your age mm -hmm. and your sophistication. Because you know there, there are three distinct generations in that show, mm -hmm. the young folk and the middle-aged folk and the mm -hmm. older folk. And I was of the young folk when I started, mm -hmm. you know, and then now I'm sort of in the middle and I look at the older people and say, I'll get there, I'll get there. Yeah. 
Um, but the resonance between generations mm -hmm. is a, a study in all kinds of human emotions mm -hmm. and regrets and dreams unfulfilled and all kinds of things that are mm -hmm. much more than a bunch of Follies girls coming back to the theater the night before it's going to be torn down. So I will vote mm -hmm. on that it's, a, that it's extraordinary. It's not just a cult, it's yeah. an extraordinary music. <laughs> when, when you were working on it, did you think like, did you, when you were going home and writing these things, did you think, oh, this is, this is gonna be amazing, like this is gonna be, you know, it's good that I'm documenting this, this is a big deal, like, or were you just? Well, but not so much it's good that I'm documenting it. I mean, the summer before I had worked on the Rothschilds, and had I done that, it wouldn't have been a more, as interesting a book, right? Sure. Um, and I still have some curious notes about the, the Rothschilds, actually. But um, but it, it was clearly an extraordinary experience mm -hmm. because of the people involved. I mean, you had some of those people like Alexis Smith and Gene Nelson and mm -hmm. Yvonne DiCarlo who came from Hollywood mm -hmm. with not that much theater experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you had John McMartin, who was a, a you know solid Broadway leading man. Yeah. Um, you had. The, this sort of cor chorus people, mm -hmm. most of whom had worked with Michael Bennett before, mm -hmm. and then the, the principals, the younger principals who were unknown but very good, mm -hmm. you know, of a younger age. And then you had those, the, the Ethel Chute and Fifi Dorsey, and you had mm -hmm. the, you know, this, the, the Ethel Barrymore cult, you had the older people, mm -hmm. yeah. each one of whom had his, her own curious resonance. Yeah. So it was such a, such a melting pot of people, and, mm -hmm. and everybody dealt with the rehearsal period differently. Yeah. Um, and so it really was Michael Bennett and Hal to steer, steer the direction in mm -hmm. ways that was as comfortable as possible for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, you're talking about all of these different elements coming together. And I want to, I know we're going to pick at each one of those elements. Yeah. As we go. <laughs> Shoot. Um, the original production, though, it runs for over 500 performances, but ultimately loses almost all of its original investment. You talk about coming on board, right. it's already over budget. Right. Um, so, director and producer Hal Prince has called Follies a prestigious flop. Do you, <laughs> do you agree with that? A prestigious flop, absolutely. Prestigious absolutely. flop. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I think is, is important to factor in is I believe Hal Prince was first and foremost a brilliant producer. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, he was a very good director, but he was a absolutely brilliant. Nobody could touch him as a producer, mm -hmm. and he always wanted to produce musicals. When he, when he, well, he always, he always was attracted to shows that were edgy in some form or pushed the form a little bit, regardless of what they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, Forum was that, although it doesn't appear to be that. Mm -hmm. She loves me was that. Um, so he, he, and he always, I remember him saying this about company, that he wanted to budget company so it could exist at 65% capacity. Because he figured it was never going to be Hello Dolly, he was never going to get that kind of a crowd, yeah. but as a producer, he wanted to produce so that they, they would, the shows would run, um, but not at capacity. He, mm -hmm. he was very a realist about that. So when Follies came along, he knew that the world of Ziegfeld mm -hmm. had a certain glamour to it, and it needed it. So he spent the money that needed to be spent, and even though I'm sure, and there, a couple of times I think I documented, he just hated how much certain things were costing. Mm -hmm. But he didn't skimp on the costumes, for example, because you know when you go to Loveland, and you know it, it's an evocation of as close to the Ziegfeld Follies as we're ever going to get. Yeah. You needed costumes, and they were designed with bird cages and God knows mm -hmm. what. And it, it, you know they were in fact so big that the skirts had to be upstage, backstage, upstage, left and right, and the women would come with towels around them, and they they be the, the, the skirts would be lowered onto them just off stage. They'd go on stage, parade around come back off stage and they would be lifted. You couldn't maneuver Because they couldn't go through the doors in the backstage halls. Yeah. Oh my but gosh. The, you know, those kinds of things. And, and I really admire the fact that even though he didn't like the fact that it was over budget, uh -huh. at $850,000, to put it in perspective. <laughs> um, but he didn't, but he knew that to do this show, he had to do it right. And I certainly was not aware of any corners that were being cut um, that weren't okay to cut. Mm -hmm. um, and because and Boris Aronson's set was 
complicated mm -hmm. and um, full of mecha me mechanics mm -hmm. that were, you know, winched. I mean, there, there were no c computers. Yeah. Um, but he didn't, there was nothing about the original production that, that scrimped on what was necessary to do a very theatrical show that involved evoking another era. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why I, I think he, you know, he was he was really good that way. And when we got to Boston, um, he really became he knew exactly what to do as a producer when a show mm -hmm. went out of town, which was okay. We're focusing, you know, it works, but we got things to improve, mm -hmm. and we're going to improve it. When I did the book, one of the things I thought would be kind of fun, but it didn't end up being all that impactful, was. Ivan De Carlo's song, which was a throwaway, Can That Boy Fox Truck, mm -hmm. the idea, and his, sometimes the idea of the song was kind of like when he's at a party with Elaine Stritch and she's so drunk, she goes over to the piano and starts to sing um, some song and can't remember the lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, so it was this funny sort of toss. They, they cast Ivan De Carlo, she was the biggest name, mm -hmm. actually, because of the Munsters, of anybody in the show. Mm -hmm. And so this one throwaway song w w wasn't good enough, so he elaborated, he wrote a whole middle section to it. Mm -hmm. um, of her back in college with a high-voiced poet and a low-voiced football player. Mm -hmm. and it's this whole sort of, and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. So before the show opened in Boston, that whole thing was cut. So all she did when the show opened in Boston was a short version of Can That Boy Foxtrot? And the decision had already been made to replace it. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at all the critical reviews that I could find from Boston and see if anybody picked up on that. That she if, was the if, biggest star in well, but, but if anybody picked up on that sh song and said that song should be made bad, that doesn't work. Yeah. And they didn't, actually. You know, yeah. It was more sort of, you know, she makes a fun romp of this song. <laughs> <laughs> but again, yeah. that was a little esoteric, but I thought it would be interesting. And uh, you know, So again, I, I can't stress how important the out-of-town tryouts were mm. in those days. And some people are doing it. It takes a great deal of money these days to do it, but I think every modern musical that has figured out a way to be to do it before they get to New York, whether it's you know wicked and, and beautiful in San Francisco and then mm. take four months or whatever yeah. to come in, it, it just gives you a shot at what doesn't work and gives you time to, to fix it. In the Follies mm. days, it was an action-packed four weeks where work was going on constantly. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, and I think everybody did good work because they had to. Mm -hmm. You know, and Sondheim, who said he was a procrastinator, just had to go back to his hotel room and write. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah. he did. Yeah, yes, he did. He come up with some pretty good stuff. Yeah, some pretty good stuff. Some pretty good stuff. Working <laughs> well under pressure, I'm sure. And also, <laughs> the fact that I'm still here, which is a catalog of a lot of things about the, you know America between the wars, yeah. Yeah. there was no Google. Right. Yeah. How did he come up with all? I mean, yeah. a lot of it. He remembered it. I'm you sure he, he yeah. just remembered it. And I, and I bet in his papers there's a list of you know Beanie's Bath of Spear, Amos and Andy, yeah. you know, just whatever he could think of that were cultural high points of that year. Even Brenda yeah. Fraser, who I didn't know who that was, but apparently she was the first person who was famous for being famous. She okay. Was, she was a debutante on the cover of Life magazine, who was a complete a Kardashian kind of figure. Okay. Oh, right. You know, famous for being famous. Uh, um, Beginning at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, I mean, that's just an astonishing thing. Well, yeah. I'll tell you one, one funny story. Um, in my book, when I talk about I'm Still Here, and I, when I wrote the book, and I got to that moment because mm -hmm. words started to buzz around the company that, that Steve has finished Yvonne's new song. Uh -huh. and, then, and then we heard that it had been played for Hal and Michael, and they liked it, um, and probably played for Yvonne, I would imagine. And then I was handed his manuscript. The next step from him, Sondheim writing this song was to hand the manuscript to me mm -hmm. to go up to the room and type out the lyric for the for stage managers for the script. And so when I got to that point in the book, I thought, I gotta write this scene. Yeah. Because it was pretty extraordinary. Yeah. You know, and I'm typing, because by that point I knew how Sondheim liked his lyrics typed. Uh -huh. Very particular about okay. that. But I just remember reading these lyrics thinking, whew, this is, these are amazing. But what, what I bring up is, and I, when I talk about all the images that he had, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned Greer Garson. Mm -hmm. um, and as I did it, I thought to myself, I wonder who's going to ask me, what's the Greer Garson lyric? Because mm -hmm. there is no Greer Garson lyric in the song that we know. Right. Um, and nobody, the book came out, people had their reactions, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and nobody said anything. And then a, the following summer, I got a call from Sonda, uh -huh. who said, what's the Greer Garson lyric? <laughs> and I said, 
funny you should mention it. And I read it. I said it to him because yeah. I remember it. And he said, that, well, that's pretty good. Of course it's good you wrote it. Why did I cut that? And then I said, you know, I, Steve, i got to tell you, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for somebody to catch me on that. I love that no. he was so funny. <laughs> yeah, wow. My suspicion is that somebody had said to him, you know, oh, I, I read Ted's book, and, you know, what's Greg Arson lyric? And he would say, I don't know. Well, and speaking of typing up lyrics, yeah. there is this account in the book about a particular spelling of a particular word. Gallop, gallop, yes. whatever that was. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, you he, recount that for us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, th he walked in, this was when we were uh, rehearsing in the American Theater Lab on 19th Street. Mm -hmm. And he walked in one day and handed me a lyric. Um, I think he had probably written it out or something, but I don't think it was on the music, it may have been. But I remember that red, the famous red typewriter that was brought mm -hmm. to Boston. And I sat there and I typed out the lyric. And, and it, as a chorus or a dance chorus, he wrote this word G-A-L-O-P that I'd wow. never heard of. And so I, I went through the line. And he was in some meeting room rehearsal. And he came out and I handed the lyric to him. And he said, well, you wasted your time because we just cut the song. And then he looked down and said, and you misspelled the word gallop. <laughs> Just seize it. That, just, you know, just, that, that, he just, he took no prisoners. Just, yeah. You know, but it's like, okay, you know, like, type the lyric. He wanted it typed. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it's a song that ended up in, um, in Stavisky. Oh, really? really? Use the music As part of the music? music? Yeah. I, I remember listening through the score to that, and you can hear pieces just pieces from, uh, from Follies and other things in there mm -hmm. that he kind of like rearranged and put in there. Right, the world's full of girls. I mean, they, it was an expansion of the, the song, the words, world's full of girls, which was being rehearsed, I think I say in the book, when I first got there. Mm -hmm. um, but then they were going to have a whole, you know, world's full of boys and a, a, an expansion of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what he had brought in with Galop. I still don't really know what Galop means. But, <laughs> but I, yeah, no, but he was, that's just, that's the way he was. He took no prisoners and he wasn't going to, you know, beat around the bush. It's yeah. Like, you misspelled it. <clears throat> Gosh, his intentionality with every word. Can you talk a little bit about uh, working with him in the room or seeing him work with others? Well, what what I found extraordinary about him is he. it is true he had a great deal of work to do between the first rehearsal mm -hmm. and the opening in New York. I think he wrote eight songs, mm -hmm. one of which was a replacement for one that he had that he So he wrote seven songs and then an eighth to replace one of those seven songs. Okay. A song for, for uh, Alexis Smith. Um, so he had a lot of time at home working because he had to when he would come in to the studio and he would sit there and watch rehearsals invariably i would get a lyric correction <sighs> later that day mm -hmm. he'd you know call in or he'd call the stage manager and i would get you know just a couple of little word things that he would listen yeah. in the rehearsal room and then change he was a, an, an extra, among other things, an extraordinary editor of his own words. I think I say in there, there was, when in, in I'm Still Here, there was a line, I got through three commercials uh -huh. and I'm here. And then he changed it to, I got through five commercials because through three is hard to enunciate. And that was okay for a couple of days. And then he changed it to, I'm almost through my memoirs. Uh -huh. Now, all three of them are fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's better. Yeah. yeah, you know, so he would just he would keep doing that, you know, and editing his own, his own work um, in a just a, an astonishing way. When he focused, and he also he he kept saying, rightly so, he was a man of the theater. Mm -hmm. So you know, when he would write songs, send in the clowns for for what Glynis Johns can do, I'm mm -hmm. still here for what Evanda Carlo can do. He found it easier to write the more focused he was on who that performer is, and mm -hmm. and we are the beneficiaries of it because those songs are it can, now can be sung by anybody, mm -hmm. but you know they were very specifically you know Glynis John's short breath she didn't mm -hmm. have a long breath and and um, you know when he went to write Yvonne's song I do remember I think I put it in there that he walked out and turned around and said what are Yvonne's three good notes mm -hmm. and off he went. I that makes me think of. Uh when he was asked to do Gypsy, 
think he talked to, to Hammerstein about it, and, and, and he said, you know, it would be good for you. He didn't want to just write lyrics right. about it. He said it would be good right. for you to do this and, and see how to write for a star. A, a star. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, his, his, his early experiences were, as if he, he said it, you know, they were all kind of astonishingly helpful. Yeah. But it was true. When I first met him, he was in that sort of no one's, no one's taking me seriously as a composer phase. Um, and he got over it. The yeah. world got over it. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. But even company, you know, company got mixed reviews, and some people said, you know, he's a great lyricist, but this music isn't any good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Follies, Follies, because it had those what he called pastiche numbers mm -hmm. that are reminiscent of Harold Arlen, and, and on and on and on mm -hmm. and on. I, I think, I think the critical community had to take him more seriously as a composer mm -hmm. because they realized that he could, even if even if they may have thought it was lesser because it was pastiche or honoring another mm. style mm. he could do it and he could do it very well mm. and of course in follies you have the the sort of sondheim voice emerging of the the songs that take place in the present the yes. roads you didn't take and in buddy's eyes and you know those are the kind of songs so there was sort of a two two parts to the score one the reminiscent ones of the era mm -hmm. the follies era and one the emerging voice of what we soon became, mm -hmm. or what we soon learned was sort of the Sondheim signature mm -hmm. style. Well, it's interesting, to, to, you know, people, especially at the time, not being being critical of his of his writing, of his his, his composition, and, and you look at the songs, not the pastiche songs, but the ones that were in the present in Follies, and you look at stuff like The Bridge of Too Many Mornings, which is just how can you listen to that and not think it's just extraordinarily gorgeous writing. You know. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I remember listening to um, uh, Could I Leave You not that long ago, thinking, how could a man his age and his experience be so spot on mm -hmm. what, what a middle-aged woman who has not taken the road she wanted to mm -hmm. and ended up in this you know, high society life with a man who basically did nothing for her anymore. Yeah. Um, and to write all those all those images and you know and harsh mm -hmm. but but brilliant and yeah. you know w you know with humor and you know it's like poof. Well, that and you think of like the lyrics in the road you didn't take yeah. are, are 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 heartbreaking and and it is it is a man far removed in age from where yeah. Sondheim was yeah, yeah. who's gone through so much more in life and yeah. it's heartbreaking to listen. He to. was a good writer. The Ben yeah. I'll never be who remembers the Ben I'll never be who remembers him. I remember just thinking, oof, that's, you know, he knew what he was doing, this guy knew what he was doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, you know, and part of the attraction to me of, 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 the, of him, and, and it goes for Hal Prince and Michael Bennett as well, they were still hungry. Mm -hmm. mm. They were artistically hungry to be known as the artists that they very soon were known mm -hmm. as, but they weren't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in... Um, you know, people who still have hunger in them. Mm -hmm. Joel Gray, in a com other circumstance, once said to me, don't hire the man who, or the person who has just won the award. Hire yeah. the person who still wants to win it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that I think, you know, they were all, everybody was popping on all cylinders. And, uh, you know, on a piece that was really, really layered. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I, Michael, I don't know how much I said this, but Michael never liked the book, Michael uh -huh. Penn, and he wanted to bring uh, Neil Simon in to write some snappy jokes. Oh, interesting. And in a funny way, I think that Michael Bennett kind of represented the young end of the creative team, and mm -hmm. Jim Goldman represented the older edge, mm -hmm. although I'm not sure how old Jim actually was in comparison to, to Steve and to Hal Prince. Mm -hmm. But um, when I said, so that's a certain, a certain tension. That Michael didn't have a lot of tolerance for the book because mm -hmm. um, it was not, you know, he was much more, you know, let's dance it, let's do it, right? You know, let's be showbiz. Yeah. And Jim Golden was more interested in let's examine the trouble these characters are in and how we, how we paint the pictures and how we get them out of it. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. What a difference. Yeah, um, no, it was. Approach. And actually, I, somewhere I pointed out, or I said, and somebody pointed out recently that I referred to Michael as part of the drug generation and the rest of them the drinking generation. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Difference in time. Yeah. Although wow. lots of cigarettes, and the pictures in the book, I forgot, lots of, lots of, you know, cigarettes. Everyone yeah. was at the cigarette. Everybody was, everybody was smoking.